It's the Grand Center, right, Doc? Welcome to the School of Marvelous Light, Little Flock. Yesterday, we were talking about the mystery of Revelation 10. And we got cut off. So we're going to expound on it a little bit more so we can gain some greater clarity concerning the matter of the mystery. It's written in another place that the husband and the wife are a mystery. You see that? Let's stop right there and let's acknowledge that first. The relationship of a husband and a wife is actually a mystery. So a mystery is something hidden, not openly seen or obvious, you see? Something that has to be revealed. So then, if that's the case, then marriage between a man and a woman is something that has to be revealed in its time. People have been doing it for a very long time, since the beginning of time. But they didn't know why they were doing it. They didn't know why they had this need at some point in their life to settle down and get married. This sudden urge, this compulsion, you see? But they have. And people continue to do it. That's how we got here. You see? Man and a woman had to come together to make you. <laughs> so like I said, we're under this compulsion to do it, not understanding the mystery of why we're doing it. Well, the scripture says it's a mystery concerning Christ and the church. So that's the unveiling of the mystery there. That a man and a woman coming together is a mystery concerning Christ and his church. So that's the truth of the matter. A man and a woman coming together is a shadow of a higher principle, you see? That's why it's called holy matrimony. That's why you have witnesses. That's why you stand before God when you do it and you make vows and oaths because you're copying the Father. It's not something man came up with. Man didn't come up with marriage. Adam was there. Abba brought Eve and presented Eve to Adam. That was the first marriage, you see. That's why it says Abba hates divorce. So now that we understand these principles, let's unravel the mystery. The man and the woman is your thought and your feeling. God hates for them to be separated. He loves for them to be one. Because as it is written, Hear, O Israel, not everybody else, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord your God is one. See? Echad, one. Thought and feeling, one. They agree. When you suffer stress, distress, sadness, or grief, your thoughts and your feelings are in a disarray, aren't they? On the inside of you. When you're haunted, where are you haunted? In your thoughts, which then affect your feelings and cause something called paranoia, PTSD, all types of phobias, fears, you see? The feeling is just the result. It's the thought that was affected first. So when, they, when the thought and the feeling become separated, you have what's called a divorce. And that's what Abba hates. He hates for you to be double-minded. Read the scriptures and see. See, faith comes by hearing, it says, the word of God. You hear the word of God and you believe by faith that it's true what you've heard. So when he says this mystery of the man and the woman coming together, then you by faith understand that your thoughts and your feelings need to be married in one and agree in one. You by faith believe that. So that's what you spend your time laboring in all day. You understand what I'm saying? When the whole world labors in the 3D, and we know that the 3D world, you labor in the 3D world, you labor in vain. You're doing vain labors. 
because all is vanity if it's done under the sun. That's 3D. If it's done in the 3D realm, it's vanity. The inside of you, is that the 3D realm? No, it's not. It's the hidden place. It's the secret place Christ always referred you to. So if you seek ye first that place, then the rest shall be added. You see? And everybody is searching from, for something outside of themselves for salvation. Even Mount Zion and the scriptures clearly say that the Mount Zion that you have come to can't be touched. <laughs> Read it for yourself. So this Mount Zion that the innumerable amount of angels that you've come into the presence of, the scripture says, and he says you have done it, not you will do it. He says you have. If you're in the truth, then you're at Mount Zion. You've obtained salvation because what makes free? <laughs> you know what it is. The truth sets you free. So if you've obtained the truth, then now you're free because you're mentally free. You're not hindered by 3D circumstances anymore. You no longer believe the 3D. See, you can't serve mammon. Mammon means 3D, material. You can't serve God in the invisible secret place. When he tells you to seek God, where does he tell you to go? And what did he tell you to stay away from? Outward appearance. So he's telling me to stay away from the outward world because being friends with the outward world means I hate God. And being friends with it means I'm giving my attention. I'm hanging out with it. <laughs> I'm focused on it. I'm talking about it. You see? That proves I'm a friend of it. But if I'm talking about the inward world, then where is my kingdom? Just like Yahusha said. My kingdom is not of this 3D world because this is the world of vanity. Don't take my name in vain. What's the root word of vanity? Okay then. So why would God make a vain world, put you in it to serve it, and then say, don't take my name in vain, and all things are vanity? Because clearly he's telling you that that world isn't real. It's vain. It's empty. It looked like it's something, but I don't judge outward appearance, so neither should you. Because man does judge outward appearance. Read Samuel. I always say it because men hear it, but they don't hear it. He hear it, but he don't hear it. God hates judging outward appearance. See? Which means he rejects outward appearance as the answer to his question about you. He doesn't look at your outward appearance to determine an answer. He look on the heart. Now tell me if that what the Bible say or not. So then what do you look at today? Where are the thoughts and feelings at? What should you watch with all diligence, the scripture says? What is desperately wicked within you that you need to keep watch over? Mm -hmm. It always comes back to the heart because the heart is the only thing that I was looking at me looking at you. It constantly says it, but man keeps thinking rebellious. He keeps thinking opposite. God look at something he did with his hands. God don't look at that. If he did, the scripture says, circumcision availeth nothing. And you still see people doing it today, thinking it avails something. And it don't avail nothing. And so Abba want to prove it to you. So he got the same people circumcising those children, uh, molesting those children, putting their mouth on those little boys' phalluses after they've cut the foreskin off. Yeah, that's what God wanted you to do. You know that's wicked. Well, why? Because God's showing you how vain and stupid it is. It doesn't profit you anything. He clearly said, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. So if I'm judging the heart, would I be looking at your penis? But you think you're justified because it's circumcised. Read the Bible and see if they had that argument in there. Can meat destroy the work of God? That means the work that God has done within me. Can I eat something that will change that work that he did within me and defile it? No. Because it doesn't go into my heart when I eat it. It goes into my belly and then goes out into the draught, the scripture says. 
but what come out of my heart. That's what defile a man. So keep watch over that desperately wicked thing. Everything that you didn't, that you weren't supposed to have, that you desired, that you went after and chased after, that was vain, you desired it in your heart. That's what caused you to chase. That's why he said it's desperately wicked and watch for it. Set your heart on, on things on earth. That what he said? If it ain't about your heart, then how come, it's a, how come it says, set not your heart? So then what does man have the tendency to do if he's warned not to do something? He has the tendency to set his heart upon things on this earth. The scripture says don't. It's not about the heart, grandson. It's about whether I washed my hands up to the elbows. It's about whether I put that fringe on there. It's about whether my beard was shaved in this design or not. And whether they had a lineup or not. It's about whether I had on all 100% cotton on or wool. That's what it's about. And God's going to look at me then. He's going to say, look at your wool garment. You did what I told you to do. Come on in. But your heart is dirty and filthy. You that stupid to believe that? I ain't. I'm not that damn dumb to have a son that dress nice, look good, talk good, but he ain't shit. And I'm going to love him and treat him good and give him everything. You would do that? Then you're a fool. But if I had a son who was lowly, who was meek, who kept to himself and minded his own business, only opened his mouth and only extended his hand to help another, then I would look at his heart and I would love that son. And I would give him everything into his hand, like Joseph. But no, when you got the murderous sons that want to kill their own brother, oh, you want to give them everything. Yeah, that's how this world is. That's how this world is. It's all about snatching. Because that's what a beast does. You go to an animal that's been killed and it, whatever killed it is eating it. When you try to get a piece of that shit, what that animal gonna do? He gonna lash out, he gonna attack your ass as if he's trying to eat you. And all he is doing is keeping you from eating his damn dinner. Look how a beast is. Men share. When they're eating a sandwich and their friend come and look at the sandwich, they break it in half and give it to him. They don't do like the fucking pit bull does because you're not a fucking dog, I thought. But y'all acting like dogs, so then don't get offended when Yahusha call you dogs. Yahusha doesn't talk like that. Did you read Revelation, nigga, or did you not? Because uh, he said outside of the walls of Jerusalem, outside, there's some whoremongers out there. There's some idolaters out there. There's the fearful and unbelieving out there. And then there are also dogs. So do you think he's talking about Fido when he says dogs? You might be like, yeah, he's talking about dogs. Like Noah's Ark. Okay, well, was he talking about a physical dog when he called that Canaanite woman one? Uh, 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 uh. That's why he says, faith, I have not found like this in Israel because Canaanite woman said, true, Lord, I am a dog. She knew it and understood her place. You don't believe me? Read it. It might shock you if you've never read it before. She'd be talking to Yahusha. Yahusha be ignoring her. And here y'all is talking about your fanciful idea of Jesus. Yahusha was ignoring that woman when she was talking to him. And then she continued to go after him, go after him, go after him. And he said, what you want? Don't you know it's not right to give these gifts that I've got for my people, to give it to you? Don't you know that ain't right? And she said, true, Lord. Cast it unto dogs, he said. It's not right. It's children's bread, man. It's for the children. The master's table. True, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, though. Don't they? True. That's right. You're right. When you're eating your plate of food and your dog's looking at you with those big old puppy dog eyes, you can't even help it. You don't even want to give him a piece. But you end up giving him some because he just won't stop looking at you like that. Some dogs don't even make a noise. They just sit there and look at you. You can almost see a tear coming out of the puppy's eye. He's like... Hoping a little morsel gonna get tossed out. And when you toss it, he sna snatches it up, doesn't he? He gobbles it up. That's right. That's right, he gobbles it up. That's right. You see? So these just be truths that I'm telling you. 
Your thoughts and feelings have to be one, unified. That was the mystery of Revelation 10, of the water and the earth, standing in on both. You got to stand on both within yourself because we're all male and female, created he them and called their name Adam. People forgot that part of creation. They thought he made Adam, then he made Eve. No, he made Adam. That's what he said. And then he separated. That's why Adam said, bone of my bone. He didn't say, that's some other bones. He said, that's my bones. That's my flesh. That's my flesh and blood right there. That's what he said. Not someone else's flesh and blood. That's me. That's right. That's your feelings, brother. That's, that's, that's the manifestation of your feelings. That's the way God designed the physical makeup of the feelings. You are the physical makeup of thought. And when you put them together, you get creation. You can't have creation with one or the other, but that's what you have in this world. You have competition. The right hand brain and the left hand brain are in competition for rulership. Are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? You're one thing. You're not two. And until men and women realize that, then they're gonna always fight. They're always gonna have a dispute and all they're doing actually is blaming each other for not being happy. Pay attention. Being happy means being in the Garden of Eden. So what they're saying is, man, it's your fault we're not in the garden because you dropped the ball. If you had some balls, you would have stood up to that serpent, not let him trick me. That's her attitude. Check and see in your own life, brothers, if you had a woman that was acting like that. If you was a man, then, see, it's your fault we're kicked out of the garden. The man, you're so fucking rebellious and don't damn listen to nothing. You're so masculine. <laughs> you don't listen. You're rebellious as hell and don't listen. What did God say about his wife? Those exact words. You're hard-headed. You're rebellious. You're sottish. You don't understand the word sottish? Because that's what Abba called his woman. He called her sottish. He called her rebellious. He called her hard-hearted. He called her foolish. He called her a whore. Same thing. Thing you hear it in your house when you argue with your girl, but you think you all unrighteous and filthy and nasty. <laughs> and all you doing is expressing the same thing the father is expressing to his rebellious woman. Because as long as you're being rebellious to being one, that's what you're going to see. That's part of the curse. The tender and delicate wood among you shall turn evil toward her husband. So the tender, delicate feelings you once had. Yeah, when you're happy living in bliss and in Eden, you're skipping around, barely touching the ground, like the Bible said. She did not set the sole of her foot on the ground for delicateness. See, your feelings were very light, in other words. You were just skipping along, frolicking through the flowers in your feelings on the inside because you had everything, nothing offended, everything was perfect. But because of the curse, now you're going to turn evil towards your thoughts. Feel like doing that shit. That's when you say that to yourself. I don't feel like it. When you seek to do good, evil is present with you. About to do something good. Man, I don't feel like doing that shit. I feel like it. Shit, that shit crazy to be doing that. What kind of thought is that? That's what your feelings start doing. You see what I'm saying to you? That's why this is a mystery concerning marriage and Christ in this church. That's what it's all about. You just have to be real when you read the word. Stop thinking holy is what the world told you holy was. The world lied to you about what holy was. The world doesn't even know what holy is. How could it know if being friends with them is enemy to God? How can they tell you what holy is? How can they tell you what righteousness is? How can they tell you what good is? If being friends with them niggas is enemies to God. <laughs> okay. So y'all chew on that today, little flock. And y'all be blessed. I hope we was able to illuminate the situation even further with this bright light that we got over here at the School of Marvelous Light. Silhouette, Mr. Dialogue.